Ahead of the Rangers is a lean, square-shouldered guy in a flannel shirt and jeans. He would look trim and healthy if his left arm and leg weren't all wrapped up in bandages, and his face bruised and sliced up. He winces as he shifts around to look at us, but gives a big grin as we approach. Next to him is a tall woman with dark skin and high cheekbones. She wears a white lab coat and has her black hair pulled back in a no-nonsense bun, through which she has stowed a much-chewed pen. She does not look happy to see us. Rangers, where have you been? Ms. Lawson, meet the new recruits. Recruits, meet Ms. Lawson. Forget the friendly introductions, Angie. Wasn't the deal we made with the Rangers? We give you food, you give us protection. Well, your recruits are looking pretty goddamn well fed, but we've been up to our tits in killer tomatoes for eight hours and not a Ranger in sight. <sighs> you should take it from here, recruits. Learning to deal with angry citizens is part of the job. Drift asks what she means by killer tomatoes. Apparently their plants started growing out of control, mutating, exploding, and attacking her people like they had gone rabid. She also mentions they've been calling for help forever. Drift reminds her that their reason they're here is to help. About time. Now listen, we think the mutations stem from contamination in our irrigation system. Unfortunately, the computer that operates the pumps seems to be malfunctioning and we can't shut it off remotely. Maybe its circuits are overloaded from all the alarms going off. The computer is down the corridor past the airlock behind us. I can open that lock, but if you're going to do your job and rescue our guys, see Rose. She has the current override codes for the greenhouse airlocks. Either way, we'll lead you to the computer room eventually. If you can get the computer working, you can shut down the pumps from there. If not, you'll have to go into the east and west fields and turn off the valves by hand. Now get going before any more of my people die. Phalanx asks what she knows about the computer. It's supposed to automate the irrigation and feeding, but it seems to be on the fritz most of the time. Jack asks what happened with the plants. Apparently Rose thinks it started with contamination in the fertilization system and that it's deliberate sabotage. Whatever the case, the vegetation mutated out of control along with the insects. When asked if she thinks it's sabotage, Kathy says that she doesn't think anyone in the Ag Center would do this as it's one happy family with a single goal to make the wasteland green. Jack then asks about these giant insects, and Kathy references a bald eagle-sized fruit fly with a stinger like a scimitar. Drift asks about the people in danger. Matt and Rose got to safety, but the others haven't been so lucky. Matt is the man in the wheelchair at the desk, who gives a weak hello. He called the Citadel base eight hours ago, and his left side became a mess when he was caught in the blast of one of those exploding pods. As if the rest of this craziness wasn't enough, the plants are also starting to explode. Get too close to one of those red pods, and BAM! Huh. Come to think of it, everyone who's changed into one of those pod people got blasted first. If I could get one of those pods to study, intact, I might be able to come up with a cure. You'll need to move slow and careful to get close to the pod without setting it off. If one of you greenhorns has a green thumb, that might come in handy too. I suppose a handful of fragments of pods, let's say ten, would do the trick if you can't manage to collect a whole one. If we don't find a cure, the infection will surge back and we'll all be dead. Stone answer the pod fragment he picked up outside. Nine more to go. Rose is the center's best researcher, currently in the lab trying to find out what went wrong. However, she's a bit old, so she can't exactly go out and fix it herself, which is why they called the Rangers. Her lab is where they experiment with new breeds, and it's down the hall to the east. Drift then asks about the others. Kathy mentions the researchers and farmers, still out in the fields and greenhouses. She's been watching them die on the monitors while we've been off somewhere, circle jerking each other as she puts it. And for some of the people, it's been worse. She tells us that the creature out front was her assistant, and now her people are turning into something else. Pod people. Drift asks about the facility layout. Most of the testing is done in the east and west greenhouses. The west field grows fruits and vegetables. The east field is for animal grazing and farmer headquarters, but the enclosures they were in have probably been destroyed now. Apparently the researchers were mostly in the greenhouses, but the plant growth obscures the cameras. She couldn't see what happened, but heard terrible screams. She's also been watching the farmers die. She knew them, they were good people, and now they're gone. This monitor system is rigged through the whole facility, but the plants have wrecked it in parts. With that, they say goodbye. Yes, go. Do your job. I'll open the central airlocks for you now, but remember, we might have people trapped in the greenhouses, so talk to Rose for the door codes.
team then addresses Matt. After a brief conversation with Angela, he addresses the rest of us. Hmm, I recognize the uniforms, but not the faces. Y'all must be the new recruits. Hope this ain't your first dance, though, because I got a feeling it ain't going to be a walk in the park. Name's Matt Forrestal, and I guess I'm the boss around here. Used to wear one of them stars, though, back in the day. Drift asks what he does as the boss. Normally, he keeps everything organized and running along. Today, he's getting blown up and failing to protect his people, apparently. He's lost a lot of good people, but he's proud of everyone for not panicking or letting tensions rise. He then tells us if we find anyone in the complex, he'll make sure we get commendations and compensation for helping them. She then asks about his history as a ranger. He wore the badge before Vargas's hair turned gray and Ace was still a three of clubs. He quit to join the Ag Center after taking a bullet to the gut. It didn't hit any organs, but he couldn't move like he used to. He joined the Center because he figured it was another good way to make the Wasteland a better place and make a profit at the same time. He has a distribution deal with the Rail Nomads, and hopefully they'll be keeping the local communities fat and happy, including the Citadel. The setback caused by this crisis might change that, though. Drift then asks about the exploding pods. They explode when you get too close to them. He tried to pull a farmer out, and one went off like a grenade. He still hasn't gotten all the shrapnel out, and it stings like damnation. Drift asks if he heard about Ace's death. He thinks he knew before the Rangers did. Apparently one of his farmers named Skinner spoke to a wandering merchant who saw the attack. He recognized Ace by his description. Skinner helps cultivate fungi in the mushroom caves. He's a bit partial to snake squeezins. Last time Matt saw him was in the mushroom caves. He was looking for his family after the plants went crazy. Matt has a few supplies for trade. The team sells the extra M2 rifle stone found along with all of their junk. In exchange, they buy three doses of anti-venom, three basic trauma kits, and four pocket medic packs. They notice a safe near the door to the east, but with Matt and Kathy right next to it, they decide to leave it alone. Past the eastern airlock, they try the southern door. This research lab looks like a crazy woman went to town here. Bottles, flasks, and samples taken from the mutant veggies lie everywhere. A hunched, gray-haired old woman with a face like a dried apple tells them not to touch anything. She has a kindly smile, but eyes sharp as cobra fangs. She also has a high-tech artificial left arm and a revolver peeking out from under a lab coat. Angela says that Rose's science junk gives her the willies. Rose and Angela have a brief conversation regarding Angela's technophobia, then Rose addresses Team Echo. She apologizes for being brusque, but everything in this room is an experiment in progress. Drift gets straight to the point and asks if Rose has the airlock codes. She does, but asks to come with the team. She wants more samples if she's going to make sense of what's happening. She can take us through the doors herself and help us find our way. She also has a gun and can take care of herself. Drift asks about this gun, and she is told that every rose has his thorn, hers is just an antique. The team quickly convenes and decides that, much like with Angela's joining, having someone with them that knows what they're doing is never a bad idea. Rose tells us we can stock up from her lab supplies, which includes some ammo and a stick of TNT for some reason. At the other end of the lab is a locked door. Rose warns us to be careful as she asked one of her techs to secure some of her valuables. She can't disable the rather aggressive countermeasures on the safe. Jack gets the door, and inside is a clean, tidy room. Almost too tidy. A trap? Or someone who simply trusts too much? Only time will tell. There are two crates and a safe in here, and Jack notes a working tumbler and a trap. Stone takes a closer look at the trap, and it looks easy to disarm. He's wrong. A booby trap explodes with a resonating boom, hitting all four members of Team Echo. The damage wasn't too severe, and with the explosive gone, Jack can unlock the safe. There's some ammo and a medic pack inside. Instead of letting Drift use it though, Stone and Jack elect to take their pain relievers. Past the lab, a young woman in a straw hat and a muddy jumpsuit staggers toward us. Bleeding from lacerations on her face and arms, she holds out her hand as if blind. As we approach, she calls out to someone named Ryan for help as something's wrong inside of her. Before anyone can help, she transforms. A pod person turns its pod-studded head toward us, eight meters away. Having seen the explosive remains of one, Jack elects to avoid it. Everyone follows suit, and Angela Death screams as she hits the pod person, terminating its horrible mockery of life. The pod person's explosion forces open a nearby safe, which had some energy cells in it. Up ahead, they see the airlock for the eastern greenhouse, but before having Rose open it, they want to check out the west wing. To the side is a wooden door that has seen better days. It's jammed and falling off its hinges, blocking our path, but Stone gives it a bit of manual motivation. Inside there is a safe and an explosive pod right in front of it. 
Everyone else steps back, and Phalanx fires a burst from his SMG, then steps forward to grab a pod fragment. The pod's explosions dislodged another safe, which had some ammo and another medic pack in it. As they get near the other door, Kathy sends them a quick message. Rangers, I'm seeing one of our researchers near your position. Is that Winston? Help is coming, Winston. The door to Winston's position is locked and trapped, so Stone and Jack do what they do best in these situations. Hoisted up on a twisted and overgrown berry bush is a bald researcher impaled through the belly by a thorned and twisted creeper. More creepers have coiled around his arm and legs and seem to be pulling at him. The plants are so tightly bound into this poor sod that even the slightest activity will likely prove fatal. Luckily, the latest addition to our team is a very skilled surgeon. It takes some doing, but she gets Winston free. Freed from the cruel embrace of the plant life, the escaped worker takes a moment to recharge before heading to the infirmary. Near him is a crate with some 30 6 ammo. Moving ahead, they see a pile of crates. The labels on all these crates say contents, one watermelon. They spy the western airlock, and near it is a poster. The Finn! Once again, instead of heading into the greenhouse, the team chooses to explore the northern wing. There's another explosive pot, which Phalanx takes out with a loud rat-a-tat-tat. As they enter the room, they intercept a transmission on their radio. Come in, Ranger Citadel! Come in, Scorpion HQ! This is Bergen again! Calling from High Pool! We are still under attack! These damn wreckers are blowing us to pieces! Send help! Anyone! High Pool, this is Ranger Citadel. Our closest team is already answering a call at Ag Center, but they will try to reach you as soon as they can. You read me? Over. Yeah, yeah, Vargas. We've heard it all before. High Pool always comes last, doesn't it? The Scorpions don't treat us like second-class citizens. The Scorpions don't move! Shit! Hit the deck!